He said, my mother's womb. <laughs> you put that down on the passport forms. Sort of or- point of origin, mother's womb. <laughs> <laughs> and here's that saying, well, your, mo- your, your body comes from. It's not your body. If it was your body, you could actually tell it what to do. You can tell it's a sit still body and don't ache. So who does this body belong to? It belongs to nature. It's nature's body. And that should be very obvious to you. Because when it's nature, wants it to get sick, it gets sick. Usually at the most inconvenient times. When nature says it's time to die, you die. It doesn't matter how you struggle and say, no, I don't want to go, I'm too young to die, I've got too much to do. All the struggle in the world won't help you, it just makes matters worse. When nature says, time's up, time's up, you might as well just do it peacefully. So this body doesn't belong to you, so why are you worried about it so much? Now this mind, does that belong to you? Are you the owner of your doer? Are you the owner of your will and choice? Ask any psychologist, especially into advertising. Know that you're very easy to be manipulated. You're very prone to being brainwashed. Your will can be controlled very easily. And for the last four days, I have been controlling your will. (laughs) I've been taking over your mind, literally. (laughs) It's not yours. And it's actually, it's not my will's doing this. It's my teacher's will. It all comes from the Buddha. He's taking over your mind. <laughs> what a wonderful thing to do. And are you the one which knows? Delusions say, yeah, it's me knowing this. It's me doing all of this. So it means that when you get good meditation, you feel great. I can do it. When a terrible meditation, I'm hopeless. Both are utterly deluded. You are neither hopeless nor, you're, nor are you brilliant. You are nothing. There's no one there to praise or blame. So shut up, sit still, and just enjoy the journey. That's delusion. So it's great overcoming delusion. And I will give you more information on how delusion is overcome with the insights based on superpower mindfulness. Any questions on that one? Okay. Next question. If both samatha and vipassana meditation are the same and lead to enlightenment, then could one practice vipassana without samatha, as some Burmese tradition teach, teachers teach? Then why are there two different sets of meditation objects for samatha, 40 objects, and vipassana, four dumb objects, meditation? Thank you. Okay. If you think you're doing samatha meditation, then you will do vipassana at the same time. You may be sold a package of Samatha, but Vipassana is right inside. If you are doing Vipassana meditation, if that's the package you've bought, then Samatha is right inside. Every model comes with Samatha and Vipassana as a standard feature. It's not optional extras, it's standard. (laughs) Then why are there two different sets of meditation objects for Samatha, 40 objects, and Vipassana, four dumb objects? They're not. It's all the same. Look, let's take the one you're doing now. One of the 40 meditation objects is Anapanasati. Meditation on the breath. What the four Dhamma objects meant here by Vipassana, it's the four Satipatthanas of the body, feelings, uh, jitter, mind and mental objects, or Dhammas. Now, I've mentioned this already, it's in black and white, one of the famous sayings of the Buddha repeated several times, any meditator who fulfills Anapanasati, who does that meditation object, fulfills the four Satipatthanas. It's in the Anapanasati Sutta. Read it for yourself. It's number 118 of Majjhima Nikaya. Anapanasati Sutta. You see it there, black and white, the teaching of the Buddha, it's not just in the Theravada, it's in the Agamas, the Chinese Recension, the Mahayana teachings of the Buddha. If you do Anapanasati, at the same time you're doing the four Satipatthanas. That's the teaching of the Buddha. Not a Burmese monk, not Ajahn Brahm, not this monk, that monk, the teacher of the great monk, the Buddha himself. I make mistakes, other monks make mistakes, the Buddha never makes mistakes. So go to the source, go to the origin, you see there, if you do Anapanasati, you fulfill the four Satipatthanas. The Buddha says that. 
You can see it in the Anapanasati Sutta. So, that's one of the meditation objects which is the same as Vipassana. It, it is in both the 40 objects of meditation and the Satipatthana. In other words, there's no difference there. It just transcends. It joins together. They combine. They're the same. It's just two different ways of looking at the same thing. If you don't believe me, if anyone likes to find me a copy, of, is there a library here in this temple? I don't know if there's a library here. If there is a library here, they may have the, some of the English translations of the middle length sayings. You can get it out and read it to everybody. But it's right there, Majjhima Nikaya Sutra 118. Check it out for yourself. And all the other meditation objects which I have there, like the four Brahmaviharas, loving kindness, that will also fulfill the Satipatthanas as well. Loving kindness is a valid way which leads all the way to enlightenment, says the Buddha. Liberation through compassion. So you can do it that way if you want. And at that time you're still doing the Satipatthana, you're still doing insight practice as well. They always go together. You cannot separate them. Any questions on that? Next question. Dear Ajahn, we have been focusing on the mind. What about the soul and the spirit? Can you please share your thoughts and your views? Thank you. Now, if you go deep, you'll find out what this word soul means and what spirit means. I've also actually mentioned actually where spirit comes from, the actual word, the the uh, English word comes from inspiration or respiration. It's like respiriting the body, literally. Inspiration means giving energy to the spirit. Being spirited means actually, you know, being full of passion or compassion. Spirituality. So it all comes, it's just these words we use in English, which means something in the middle of you, your essence. And when we have this idea of soul, this is a word which people have used for a long time who actually recognize that when you die it, it's not just a nothingness happens afterwards. It's something which goes across from life to life. Now the thing is you can call that a soul. I don't mind people calling it a soul as long as they realize that soul is in constant change. It's a changing soul. The problem is that some people, because of delusion, because they don't see clearly, because they haven't investigated it, think that actually the soul is an entity which never changes, which is always the same from time to time. And that's the only difference between, say, uh, Christianity, well actually Christianity always, well it's actually modern Christianity, not original Christianity, they have the idea of only two lives, this life and heaven, or hell, and that's all. So, uh, Early Christianity had reincarnation exactly the same as Buddhism. All the Greek philosophers, they all believed in reincarnation. From Plato to Socrates, Heraclitus, Pythagoras, they were all into reincarnation. They wrote about it. And that tradition carried on into early Christianity. And there was actually, I think, the Nicene Council and the Constantine, about third, or third century, I think, uh, that they decided not to have reincarnation anymore. But many scholars look at the original Bible, they look at the other texts of the time and say, that was an anomaly. Early Christianity had reincarnation just like anybody else. And many Christians remember their previous births, for goodness sake. So you know, they know they've been reborn before. So reincarnation is part of things. So the only difference between Christianity, Hinduism and Buddhism is that they all recognize that there's a flow from one life to the next. In the Christianity and Hinduism, they think of that as a soul. And actually, it appears to the observer, the uninitiated observer, when you die, that you're carrying on. It feels like you. It has all of the the signs that that's you carrying on. But just in the same way, same way that it seems to be you who started this retreat, who was here on Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and today's now day, that it's the same person, but it has changed. Sometimes we don't see the change, but it has changed. When we actually see the changing nature of this soul, then we have what the Buddha called the stream of consciousness. And that's what anatta means. No self doesn't mean no thing. 
there is this movement we call the movement of uh, nama rupa and consciousness of mind and body always changing and that you can if you don't look carefully you think that's a soul but in it, effect in, in rather in truth it's completely changing from one moment to the next it's a process not a thing ok Maybe I'll get into that later on when I... Am I talking about... Yeah. Life is... No, no one at home, Anatta. I'll talk about that in depth then. But is there any questions or comments about that for the time being? Okay, next question. Venerable Ajahn, I have heard some people going crazy while practicing meditation. Maybe they use the wrong method or attach to the happenings during meditation. Please guide me how to overcome this fear. Thank you. Actually, there's more people have gone crazy when they're not meditating (laughs) than when they're meditating. That's like somebody saying, I've heard that people die when they're in bed asleep. Most people die in bed. That's a fact. Does that make you afraid to go to bed at night? (laughs) Of course not. (laughs) There's nothing to do with it. More people go crazy when they're not meditating. So... That particular fear, I know that some of these evangelicals say that, oh, don't meditate. If you meditate, the devil will come in. And that's not true. If you meditate, the Buddha will come in, and the Buddha is not the devil. (laughs) Wisdom, compassion, kindness, peace, problems get solved in meditation. The chances of you going crazy in meditation are just so small there's more likelihood that you would trip over and hit your head and die because, you know, you've... you've, uh, Actually, there's more chance of getting kicked to death by a duck than by... (laughs) (laughs) than actually getting crazy in meditation. So, but what happens with some people, some people have got schizophrenic tendencies. They hear sounds and stuff. And so such people that when you get into deep meditation, the sounds which you hear get even stronger, the nibbutas get more vivid. And it's those people who have trouble with meditation. Well, you can usually check them out pretty quickly. And uh, all you need to do is just stop them before they get too deep. They don't really go crazy, it's just for a little while, sort of they're a bit out of things. But they get back together again afterwards, it's no big trouble. But you don't go crazy while you're meditating. You go crazy when you're not meditating. So don't have any fear. I have been teaching meditation for years. I have no casualties yet. (laughs) And I don't intend to start having casualties. (laughs) Next question. A friend who had been meditating had these experiences. One, he had seen his deceased grandfather. I advised him to share merits with his grandfather after meritorious deeds by picturing him telling him that he is sharing merits with him, wishing him happiness and asking him to be reborn in a better state. This is a good way. Yeah, it can be a good way, but sometimes it depends on what you see as your grandfather. If it's the beginning of a meditation, you can't really really trust it. The beginning of meditation, it could be just imagination. If it's deep into the meditation, or you're a really good meditator, then perhaps it might be true. But you check out, what does your grandfather look like? If he's happy... He's probably a deva come to say hello. You don't need to share merits with him. He's probably come to share merits with you. (laughs) But if they come and they look very miserable and thin and unhappy, then share merits with them. You don't need to give money to a rich person. So that's what you do there. But if if you do see them actually in deep meditation or in your dreams and they look sort of really thin and haggard and unhappy that's a sign they need some merits from you if they otherwise if they look really peaceful and and bright usually clothed in white then you don't need to give merits to them they're having a great time they've just come to say hello they're not asking for anything they just want to give you their compassion number two lately he had been followed by a dark being I advise him to do the same could this being be his grandfather again, or is it another deceased relative or friend seeking merits? Dark beings. Now listen, if you can look at them, if you follow by a dark being, turn around and say hello. 
Is you don't need to be afraid of anything in life except fear itself. So whatever you're being chased by in life, always turn around and face it and ask, what do you want? And then you find out a lot of time it's dark being is only fear and it's not real. So if it is your grandfather again, they wouldn't be following behind you. They come and see you face to face like they did in life. Unless, you know, your grandfather's actually probably, this is actually probably the case that you'll be followed by the CIA. Well, <laughs> I don't know what the Malaysian Secret Service is. Maybe it's that. Maybe they're checking you out. No. Followed by a dark being. Just turn around, face that being, and just say hello. And see what they want. If it is, it's very, very, very unlikely that the being will be seeking merits from you. They usually come to temples and seek merits from the monks. Because we've got no merits to give. This is the bank where people actually draw out cash. This is the place we disperse merit. <laughs> so they usually come places like this. So the chances are it's just fear, not really the, the real being. But anyway, you can always uh, share merits. Anytime, it's always good. You can't go wrong with sharing merits. So he, as such, he'd stop meditating, fearing that this being will enter and possess him whilst meditating. Is this possible? No, you don't get possessed while you're meditating. You get dispossessed. Dispossessed of greed, hatred and delusion. Dispossessed of anger. Dispossessed of stupidity. Dispossessed of pain and fear. Dispossessed of guilt. This is letting go, dispossession, not possession. So again, I've been teaching meditation so long, never once has someone been possessed by a being during this meditation. Never once. Now listen, this happened to one of my students a long time ago. She was meditating at home. She was very still and she heard this voice very clearly in her ear. And what the voice said took her out of her meditation immediately. The voice said, I have come to take over your mind. Ah! <laughs> she thought, I've come to take over your mind. So she came to see me. Ah, so the spirit was coming to take over my mind. I said, now listen. If someone was, say it's a burglar, if someone was coming to burgle your house and take all your possessions, would they knock on your door first of all and say, Madam, please excuse me, but I'm coming to rob your house tomorrow night. <laughs> if it was a burglar, they'd just do it. They'd come in there and steal. So I said, look, if it was really a demon, they wouldn't give you any sort of indication, I'm coming to take over you. They'd just come in and take it. If they could do that, which they can't anyway. So I said, listen, that is just fear. So forget it. No demon in their right mind would come and tell you what they're going to do. <laughs> so it's just fear which creates those things. So as soon as she heard that, she started meditating again, no problem at all. So you cannot get a being enter and possess you during the meditation. If you want to go into trances, that's a completely different method. When you let some being possess your mind, you have to let go of all of your mindfulness and completely abandon sort of your mindfulness, your knowing. And even then it's very difficult for actually beings to get in there. Sometimes it's almost as if you give your permission. It's like house vacant sign so that something can come in there. But it's very difficult to do that. Only a few people can do that. And you have to have absolutely no mindfulness whatsoever. Almost like being in a hypnotic trance, but even less than that. So it's very, very, very rare. As for you, it's impossible. Number two, because for bad beings to get into your mind, only bad beings want to play around like that. Now, no good beings would do that. That's not their place. It's not right. It's not correct. And any bad beings, they can't come close to monasteries like this, to temples like this. They can't even come in the door, in the gate. There's too much good energy in monasteries such as this, in temples such as this, that you are fully protected. You don't know how much force field it is around this place. Bad spirits just can't come in. They can only stand outside the door and sometimes that's what they do to ask for merits. They can't come inside from outside.
because bad bad beings, this place is too powerful for them. They can't cover. 